So uh, we're finally back to doing a 10 minute philosophy. As you can tell, I'm not wearing my brace right now. Um, I should be off it completely next week, but my doctor basically said, you know, just slowly start taking it off. I'm already taking it off to shower and stuff like that. But anyway, enough about me and on to the topic. Today, we're going to talk about the warrior tradition. And this is really important to me. Obviously, this channel is called The Warrior Philosopher. And over time with my videos, I think I've, I've more and more been drawn to this, this specific sort of way of life, you know, like I always knew sort of what it was related to. It was related to being, being like a warrior scholar, being one who who strove for aesthetic perfection, for a perfection of the body, to be able to use that body uh, through martial arts, which is essentially the practice of warfare, and also have the intellect to know how to correctly use that strength. You know, I always consider um, myself somebody who who didn't quite get along with the common train of thought, this common sort of way of life that you see today, which I would characterize as, as a bourgeois way of life, one which is heavily driven towards materialism, consumerism, and, and not towards these sort of spiritual ideals that the warrior embodies. And the more I think about it, when I think about the way of the warrior, it's essentially a combination of beauty and power. And what I mean by that is one can just have strength, but if they don't use that strength beautifully, then some element is missing. Anyone can wield a sword or carry a rifle and, and kill mercilessly, but what is the point of that? There has to be a beautiful way of using one's skills, and I think that is rooted in something resembling health and virility that Nietzsche talks about. It's something that resembles conquering the unconquerable. See, killing civilians, killing innocents, there's nothing honorable about that. There's nothing beautiful about that. There is something beautiful in David taking down Goliath and conquering the unconquerable. There's something beautiful in Achilles, you know, coming forward against, against the Trojans, cutting them down, eventually defeating Hector in battle. There's something beautiful in the last stand of the samurai under Seigo Takamori um, during the Satsuma Rebellion at the beginning of the Meiji Restoration. There's something beautiful about men who try to conquer the unconquerable, who go forward despite knowing they're going to lose. If you look at the 300 at Thermopylae, they knew they were going to lose. They knew that, I mean, they essentially, they stood their ground to cover the retreat of other Greek city-states, including the Athenians, uh, Thebians, and whatnot. Uh, they knew they were going to die. They were, they were the final, because, you know, for those of you that don't know, the Battle of Thermopylae started off with roughly a thousand Greeks, or sorry, roughly 7,000 Greeks, and those 7,000 Greeks fought off maybe 200,000 Persians, but the Persians found a hidden passageway in which they could flank the Greeks who were defending the small pass of Thermopylae. And after they, they found out that the Persians found out, they ordered a mass retreat. However, the Spartans stayed behind to slow down the Persians so that they didn't catch up to the rest of the Greeks. They know they were going to die. They knew they were going to die, and they fought anyway for this sort of heroic ideal. The Spartans believed they were descendants of Hercules. They were the Dorian Dur people, and they believed they were descended from the greatest hero known at that time, whether he, had, whether he was a real person or whether he was legend. And in this sort of belief in a mythical origin of being something greater, something more, that is the way of the warrior. It's living a life in accordance with the gods or in accordance with God, depending upon your faith, right? You look at the crusaders or even the jihadis, right? The, the, the Christian crusaders and, and the jihadis who clashed over Jerusalem. They fought with religious fervor. They fought for for a greater meaning, they fought for a higher power. And, you know, whether you agree with their wars or not, you have to recognize there is a certain beauty to the selflessness and the sacrifice of warriors who believe in something more, who aren't just fighting for material gains. Maybe the leaders of these warriors are, are fighting for material gains, are using subversive, subversive mes measures like you see today. But the warrior himself, uh, for most of history, has, has, always, has always fought for something more pure. It's only recently, as time has go gone on, that you've really seen war 
lose that spiritual element as Julius Evola talks about in the metaphysics of war. War was a spiritual thing for most of history. Whether that, that spirituality was, was real or not, the warrior believed it was real. And today, I don't think any soldier really believes in, in, in the mission ultimately. And if they do, it's an abstraction of, of, of what the true elements of war should be. War should be a competition in which the greatest, strongest force overcomes the weaker force. It's where the the forces of nature clash together and the strongest, most beautiful organism triumphs. The lion, the young lion who, who who is trying to conquer a new pride, he fights the old lion and he wins because he is young and youthful and has vigor and he overcomes the old lion. This is how war ought to be and has been traditionally for most of human history. Now, it's, it's been distorted into, into such heavy mechanization, into people pressing a button from miles away and blowing up some guy eating his lunch. It's lost an element of the personalization, the beauty of cutting another man with a sword, of, of training your body to aesthetic perfection, to be strong enough to defeat another man, to overcome him face to face, man to man. And, and like I said, there is an element lost in just shooting a man from a distance. And not to say there isn't art in modern warfare, not to say there aren't warriors today, but there are far fewer warriors fighting our battles. There, there is far less spiritual spiritualization in warfare. God and the gods are gone from the battlefield, right? In a metaphorical sense, and it's really sad to see. And I think if we if we look at the history of how social hierarchies have shifted over time, this might seem like I'm beating a dead horse because I've th I've talked about this so many times. How the warrior elite has been replaced by a mercantile elite, by the bourgeois class, by the economic class. But it's something we have to look at again and again to really understand what's happening to the world. You know, if you want to surf the Kali Yuga, if you want to ride the tire, you have to know what the hell is going on. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about warrior traditions, specific warrior traditions throughout history, and the implication of having a warrior tradition and the loss of warrior tradition today. So, as many of you know, I'm in the United States Marine Corps, and I, you know, I, it comes up a lot, excuse me, it comes up a lot, what is a warrior? Like, the Marine Corps today, they try to believe, they try to tell us we're warriors. They try to say, you are a warrior. You are the warrior class of the United States of America, but I don't believe it. I see the people serving to the left and right of me. Some of them are out of shape. Some of them are injured. And, you know, I'm injured too, but, but they use that injury to, to do what's called malingering in the military, to try to avoid training. They say, oh, I'm, I'm hurt. I can't do this. I can't do that. I've been going to the gym almost every day for the past two weeks, despite being injured, despite literally breaking my neck a month and a half ago. You know, because I do believe in that heroic ideal. I believe in the aesthetic ideal. I want to be the strongest, most intelligent warrior I can be. But most people in the military are, military are just there to be there. And the Marine Corps is not the worst example of this. If you look at the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, most people are in it for the benefits. They're in it because they don't know what the hell to do. They're in it for, you know, free college, whatever, right? And, you know, I did a deployment with the Coast Guard, and I got to say, out of all the branches, Coast Guard, brilliant branch to join. If I had to redo it, then I'll, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't redo my choices because I'm happy where they brought me to today, but I would recommend joining the Coast Guard. It's the best balance, I think, of actually doing a mission and having that camaraderie and still having military traditions. But that's a conversation for another time. We're talking about the warrior tradition. And like I said, there is a great element of the warrior tradition that is lost in today's military. And I think it's because there is no more artistry in warfare, at least there's less artistry, and on top of that, there is no more warrior class. It used to be that in the past, those who ruled a nation were the warrior class, whereas today, uh, the vast majority of the military come from the lower socioeconomic classes of society. And it's like, how is an army supposed to have a warrior spirit if they aren't the ones in charge of a country, what is the point of fighting wars for some senator? I bring this up again and again, the song Senator Son about the Vietnam War. It wasn't the senators fighting in battle the way that Roman consuls had to lead their legions against Germanic hordes. It wasn't the senator's sons even that were fighting. It was some poor farmer kid from, from Iowa. It was some poor black kid from the ghetto. It was some, you know unlucky son of a factory worker in Pennsylvania, right? It was, it, were, it was the lower socioeconomic classes of society. Poor white kids, poor black kids, poor Mexican kids fighting for this country. And of course, you know, a few Asians as well, but there, were, there weren't as many of us back then, but 
shout out to all my Filipino veterans, respect. But um, it was the poor people of society. And when you have the poor uh, making up the majority of your armies, um, like size, then then it's like what what reason do they have to be fighting? They're not fighting for their own prowess, their own prestige. They're just fighting for some senators, some businessman, the military industrial complex who doesn't give a shit about them. They're fighting for people that don't care about them. They're fighting for people who aren't fighting the battles themselves. Even when you go back to knight, like medieval times or samurai times, they did raise levies from the peasantry, but the samurai were still on the battlefield. The knights were still at the head of the battlefield, even if they raised the peasants to fight in their armies. And today, we try to preserve that through the, the whole officer system. An officer has to have a college degree. They have to get extra training. But it's not the same. It really isn't, especially when you consider the dilution of the education system. Pretty much everyone has a college degree in the U.S. nowadays. And, of course, that's an exaggeration. But much more people have a college degree than they did in the past. And being educated with a college degree does not mean shit today. I know plenty of educated people who are, quite frankly, fucking stupid. So... The warrior tradition. Let's get into some of the warrior classes of history that I want to look at. I think first and foremost, let's look at the inception of the warrior aristocracy. And to go back to to go back in time, we have to look at the the Celtic, Iron Age, and Aryan invaders. Now, they all come from roughly a similar area. It kind of ranges from around the Caucasus, the edges of the Balkans, and the steppe regions. And the reason that the warrior aristocracy comes from this area is because of the environment. They lived in hilly or open plains. They were herders of goats and sheep. They rode horses. Um, so they had more access to, to protein, to meat. They had to survive in hardier envi- in climates and environments. Um, it was a little bit colder, so they needed more calories. Uh, because they were nomadic, they, didn't, they couldn't construct these big walls around their settlements. They had to constantly move to find better grazing ground. And because of this, it was harder to defend their flocks. Raids from different tribes was very common. This is very common during uh, Mongol times, or not times, in the Mongol, uh, the Mongol Empire. Before they were unified, Mongol tribes, before they unified under Genghis Khan, were just raiding each other, stealing horses, stealing sheep, stealing goats, whatever, right? This is basically what what the history of the steppe looks like uh, all the way back 2000 BC, 3000 BC even potentially. It's different tribes raiding each other for, for their, their um, possessions. And what this means is when you're constantly being raided, you're constantly having to defend your possessions, which means you have to be game. You have to be a warrior. You're forced by nature to be a warrior. And this is something I talked about with... Um, Christian Bell from Wisdom Warriors, who I've collaborated with, it's nature demands savage excellence of us and of other organisms. The antelope from birth must run to, to, get, to get away from, from the lion who is chasing it. The lion learns to hunt as, as a child by play fighting, and, and it grows older, and it needs, it needs to be a good fighter. If it's not a good fighter, or if it's not a good hunter, it's going to starve to death. If a male lion is not a good fighter, it'll never be able to earn its own pride. A lion must defeat another lion in battle, essentially, to eventually uh, inherit the pride. He has to defeat another male lion and take his pride. Take those female lions for himself so he has the right to mate with them. He literally goes in and he massacres the cubs of the previous old lion. Nature is brutal. Little baby squirrels are eaten by black mambas while their mothers watch. There's nothing they can do about it because the black mamba has been blessed by nature as the stronger animal. Nature is brutal. Nature is savage. But nature creates beauty and it creates power. Because in nature, you must be powerful to survive. And beauty ultimately is related to health. So when we think of beautiful animals, it's often because they reflect traits that we also uh, value, that we also admire. The lion's mane is beautiful and healthy. It looks sleek because the lion is strong. It is courageous. It fights 
to the death because it has to fight to the death. Nature demands the male lion to fight to death because without a pride, the old male lion, who is not a hunter, he is a fighter, will die. He's literally like a gladiator. He's not going out there hunting. His, his physiology is not lean and fast like the female lion. It's big and bulky to fight off other male lions or, or bigger animals or fight off 20 hyenas. So you see this similar thing uh, in the early steppe people, the environment molded them. The environment created the nomadic tribesmen who had to be a great warrior, who had to be a great horseman, who had to be a great bowman. He literally rode into battle and fired arrow after arrow at his enemies. That's a very difficult thing to do. I've never done it. I've done a little bit of horse riding, a little bit of archery. I can't imagine doing both together. That's a crazy amount of skill. And this is why the early warrior aristocracy came from the steppes. If you look at Europe, the Celtic invaders, who eventually became the rulers of Europe, swept in from the Caucasus steppe regions, and they conquered these sedentary farmers, these sort of matriarchal societies that I've talked about in previous videos. Uh, before you have the warrior aristocracy, you have more or less egalitarian matriarchal societies of of farmers. Uh, they farmed the lands in Europe, Mesopotamia, India, and, and what happened was these warlike invaders, and I recommend Carol Quigley's Devolution of Civilizations. This is a lot of where I get my information from. These warlike peoples who spoke guttural languages formed by their rough environment, who worshipped warlike gods like Thor, Odin, Zeus, Ares, these were the ones who came from the north and invaded the agricultural sedentary peoples, and they were successful. They were better warriors, they were stronger physically because the farming societies had primarily grain-based diets. Uh, they came in, they were better warriors, they killed them, slaughtered them, took over their land, and established themselves at the top of the hierarchy. The only major civilization that resisted the invasions was Egypt, and eventually they fell as well uh, when the Persians invaded them, and then eventually Alexander's conquest put the Ptolemies uh, in power in Egypt, and they were the last of the pharaohs. But it's this idea of environments create and breed strong men, create and breed strong warriors. The Aryan invaders went to India and established themselves at the top of the hierarchy. During the Vedic period, they, they went in and they conquered India. And they said, you know what? We're going to take your Hindu religion. We're going to take your Hindu religion and we're going to combine it with our our old gods, which is essentially the same uh, tree of gods, which makes up the Celtic and Norse and Hellenic gods. And they say, you know, we're going to combine our religions uh, and we're going to put ourselves at the top of this hierarchy. You know, we're going to give them metaphysical doctrines for why we should rule. And this is the birth of the warrior aristocracy, whether it be in India, in Mesopotamia, in Greece, in Europe, right? The Greeks, um, that had power, whether it's the, the citizens of Athens or, or the Dorians in, in Sparta, they established themselves as the rulers over, for example, in Sparta, over the Helots, and, and they established themselves at the top of the hierarchy. These warlike invaders said, we are in charge now. Their blood comes from those steppe regions I talked about, their blood was formed by the environment of hardship and warfare, and that's why they were able to conquer peoples like the Helots who grew up in more uh, softer environments, let's say, easier environments. They look to the ground, right? Uh, Bronze Age Pervert talks about the, no the nomadic herder who looks to the stars. He only has the stars to keep him company at night. He has to look outward. He has to think about moving out and expanding and mastering space where the, uh, the agricultural farmer looks to the ground. He is content. Everything he needs is there. Why should he expand when life is comfortable and good? And uh, I will admit I've been watching a lot of Uber Boyo videos and, and his storytelling abilities have definitely influenced me. So if I sound like I'm copying a little bit, I can't help it. He has a beautiful story storytelling uh, method and I, I can't help but adopt some of those, some of those uh, uh, I guess, patterns or whatever. But anyway... These were the early warrior aristocracies, uh, the Romans as well, right? Um, the story of the Aeneid is that Trojans, uh, a Trojan prince, I, I guess his name was Aeneas, right? Wasn't he like the son of Venus or something like that or Aphrodite? I don't know. But the Aeneid is like one of the origin stories um, promoted by 
Augustus Caesar after he took power so that they could have this sort of imperial identity. And, and essentially, you know, this Trojan escapes the, the Trojan War and founds the city of Rome. There's also a story of Romulus and Remus, which was used during the Republican period uh, to promote meritocracy. So the two brothers fight and the strongest brother defeats the other brother. But anyway, all of these people, whether which whatever myth story you want to use for Rome, you know if it's the Trojans or it's Romulus and Remus, are they come from those warlike origins? The Trojans come from the steppes as well. All these people, peoples come from hardy environments, and they have to conquer. They have to be strong. Nature demands of them savage excellence, where they have to be great and powerful warriors. And you see the aristocracies and the elites as warriors. And what this means, and let me tell you why it's so important to differentiate a mercantile bourgeois economic elite of, of today, of post-enlightenment liberal democracy, and the warrior aristocracy of the past. And, and the most important delineation is incentive. What incentive does the warrior elite compared to the bourgeois elite have to stay game, to stay virile, to stay strong. If we look at any aristocracy that failed, it's because they lost touch with their warrior origins. If you look at uh, the, I believe it was House Bourbon, 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 whatever, House Bourbon in, 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 in France, by the time the French Revolution took place, they had no relation with their with their warrior aristocracy. The, gra the last great French king at the time, if I'm not mistaken, was the Sun King, and I believe that was Louis XIV, and his grandson didn't have that same warrior virility. He was a, a lazy, fat aristocrat who started adopting more bourgeois characteristics, being obsessed with the material. See, as the warrior, as the son of the warrior, your incentive to be as great of a, of a fighter as your father, to be as great as a general, is because if you are not a great fighter, if you're not a great warrior, your kingdom will be conquered by another. If you're not a great warrior, one of your father's generals, after his death, will come in and defeat you if you are weak. And take from you your kingdom. Another invading tribe might come in. Another invading kingdom might take you out if you are not strong enough to defend it. So the son of the king must be strong. He is forced by nature, essentially, to be savagely excellent. And if he is not savagely excellent, what happens to him? He is overtaken. He is conquered. He is defeated. But what does the bourgeois elite, what does the mercantile elite, what does the economic elite have as incentive to stay game? If you are the son of some rich banker, for example, whatever, uh, let's say you're in the Walton family, you can still maintain 51% of the stakes in a company and have it run by a board of directors. You inherit your father's wealth no matter what. It's not like the warrior who has to defend what his father gave him. He has to defend what he inherited with the sword. No, the bourgeois elite does not. And let's say the bourgeois elite doesn't want to be as smart as their father was, or as crafty, or as cunning. Will he not get into a good school if he's not smart enough? No. We have private colleges which cost seventy dollars to $100,000 a year, which are easy to get into if you have the money to pay for it. So it doesn't matter that you couldn't get into a maybe $30,000 a year school, which is better. No. We'll pay six figures for you to get the best education, son. It doesn't matter that you didn't work hard enough. You're still going to get into this school because I have connections. I'm going to get you these connections. I'm going to get you there, regardless of capability. The son of the king could not pretend. He could not hide behind his father's money the way the bourgeois does. He had to fight. If he did not fight well, he would die. He would be cut. He would be destroyed. He would be beheaded. He would be forced to commit seppuku if he was a samurai, defeated and shamed in battle. This is the reality of nature. The warrior aristocracy reflects nature, reflects being the lion, being at the top of the food chain. And when your time comes, if you grow weak, if you grow decadent, if you grow old, you are killed. There are no li old lions in nature because the young lion comes in, kills the old lion, and takes his pride from him. And if the old lion retreats, he will die in the wild because he can't hunt anymore. His body, after he takes control of the pride, forms not to hunt. It forms to fight big game. It forms to fight predators or other lions. So he no longer can survive without the pride. He is forced by nature to be savagely excellent, to be a great fighter, to bear scars from all his battles. And this is the whole idea of the warrior tradition. It is being excellent, being savagely excellent because of nature. It's spending 20 years to master the way of the bow or the way of the sword. And this differentiates him from the lower classes. You see, back in the day, before you had uh, firearms, it took 
10 years at least to master the art of war. You were training from a young age. The Spartan boys were taken away from their mothers at like six or eight to be trained in the agoge, to be forced to fight each other. Not all of them would make it to, through training. Some of them would die in training. It was a filtering process. You know, when they were born, the Greeks practiced infanticide. And unlike popular opinion, it wasn't just the Spartans. The Athenians practiced this too. Most of Greece practiced infanticide. If a baby was deformed, they would throw it off the cliffs or whatever. This is a very brutal society and it seems terrible to us and rightly so. The death of a baby is a terrible thing. We have to recognize why they did this. They did this because nature demanded the, of them savage excellence. A child with deformities or a weak child who cannot make it through training, how would they be able to fight for the army to preserve the city-state's independence and power against other city-states, right? This was the thinking. The same way, if you have a deformed animal, it will die. There is no chance for a deformed animal to make it in nature because nature has no exceptions for the weak. Nature demands you to be strong or you will die. It demands you to be quick and fast to run away from the strong if you're not a predator. And this is the whole thing with warrior tradition. It is turning warfare into an art, spending so much time learning to fight. And that's why the elites had to be uh, the warriors, because it took so much training, so much money to get the best equipment. It wasn't something that anyone could just do. And, you know, there are exceptions, right? Um, obviously, in Greece, many, many artisans were also warriors, right? However, you see a certain advantage to having a more professional army or or a sort of standing army in in Sparta every every citizen of Sparta was a warrior if you look at the Roman legions it was a profession for them one of the reasons why the Romans were so successful is because while everyone else was drawing up levies which is essentially citizen soldiers who are only part-time soldiers the Romans created a professional army where you were paid where your only job was to fight where you could spend 20 years in the legion and retire with benefits similar to as you do today in the military it was a profession. It was a way of life. It was an art form. You had to learn to fight, and that's all you did. The knights, you know, all they did in their free time pretty much was train. Of course, they partied, they drank, you know, they went they went to the tavern wenches and, and, and bought whores, but they were training to fight the same way the samurai were. The samurai were poets, scholars, and warriors. And I think this is what a warrior aristocracy should be. It should be warrior scholars, right? Um, but today, we, we pretty much exclusively have a sort of lower class army and this is due to the inception of firearms and the death of the warrior tradition sort of comes from firearms because once you could train a man to shoot relatively effectively in, in less than a month then you could train anyone to be a warrior right there's no more art or a soldier not a warrior it's not an art form in, anymore in the sense that you couldn't learn mma in a month you could not become a great mma fighter in a month it would take years to become a great mma fighter uh years to be a great football player years to be a great basketball player these things are arts when it takes so much time to master, but you give a guy a gun, you know, even even like you know, look at a Navy SEAL. It takes a few years to train up a Navy SEAL, and a Navy SEAL, you know, or or Delta Force or Special Arm, uh, Green Berets in the Army or whatever, Spetsnaz in Russia, whatever. It takes years, like three years, less than three years to train them up. Whereas it would take, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend today. It would take ten years for a longbowman. In, in, in the English uh, army to be able to learn to draw a bow back and their, their right arms are huge compared to the left because of how hard it was to draw back a bow. In the old days, it took many years to master the art of war. And when there's no more mastery for the art of war, when everyone can fight at roughly the same level, the warrior sort of loses his value. It's like, well, you know, why the hell should I follow you? I could do just as good of a job with a gun. And the whole dynamics shift incredibly. And it's no, it's no coincidence that the Enlightenment ideals rose alongside the firearm. The firearm is one of the greatest weapons of liberty and individual freedoms that there are, right? And, and there's, you know, obviously good ramifications from this. There's good outcomes and there's bad outcomes. The good outcome for the individual is like, let's say you weren't born into the aristocracy. Well, now the balance of power is equalized a lot. And that's a good thing for you. But if you think about greater society and the impacts of a bourgeois economic elite essentially replacing the warrior elite, let's look at the ramifications of that. I talked already about the incentive, right? There is less of an incentive for the bourgeois, the son of the bourgeois, to be excellent because nature does not demand much of him. He has a comfortable lifestyle. In fact, most people in the developed world live more or less a comfortable lifestyle. 
Most people in the United States, and I say most, there are still some that are suffering, but most people don't worry about food. They don't worry about shelter. They don't worry about the basic things which force a human to think harder, to work harder, right? We grow up in relative comfort, and that's a good thing, of course, right? If you think about um, greater pursuits, for, for example, intellectual pursuits, learning new things or, or, or learning an art form, whether it be martial arts or, or, or painting or, or mu music, you need free time to do that. You need to not have to just worry about survival to do that. You need some free time. But the problem is, is that most people waste this free time. They don't use this free time to master something. Some people do. A small part of the population does, but most people scroll through TikTok. They scroll through Instagram. You know, many of us are guilty of that too. It's not to say that I use my time perfectly. I'll scroll through Instagram. I don't use TikTok. I'm not that bad. But I'll, through, I'll scroll through Instagram when I shouldn't. Um, I'll, I'll scroll through the internet. It's not good, but I try to make an effort not to, and that's more than most people do. I still have my art forms that I pursue. Most people will waste their freedom. Freedom is a privilege. And, and this is why the warrior classes had so much uh, privilege, or so much freedom, excuse me, because freedom is a privilege of power. If you think about America today, where do you, your freedoms come from? You know, we have this idea of God-given freedoms, and from a metaphysical sense, this could be true, right? But from a material sense, why are you free? Why are you physically free right now? And the answer is you are physically free because the American government is strong enough to afford you these freedoms, which also means the American government can take them away if they have the power to do so, right? So you have to think about that. Freedom is a privilege of power, and the warrior elites had this power, right? And when war is something that you can train to be great at, where, where it takes some sort of effort to attain mastery in the art of war, 10 years training, right? Then it's, it's, it's sort of a clear picture to attaining power. You have to work harder to be more powerful. So that's why I talked about with incentive. What incentivizes the sun to also be smart and strong, intelligent and a great warrior? Because if he's just a good fighter, it doesn't matter. You need tactics. You need strategy to win battles. You need to be smart and intelligent. You need to be smart and intelligent enough to manage your economy. You need to be smart and intelligent enough to, to manage the political realm of ruling a kingdom. And this is missing, I think, in, in, in a bourgeois-dominated modernity. Yeah, of course, we still have politics. We still have competition in business, but it's less necessary to do so. If we do bad in business, you're not going to die. You're not going to be conquered. You're going to make less money. There's a lot more of an incentive when nature forces you to be excellent than uh, monetary rewards, right? And, you know, plenty of people still work hard, but you think, how are they working hard? How much of human innovation today actually makes, actually brings us towards um, sort of like futuristic goals? How much of, of innovation today actually propels humanity forward? How much of it is SpaceX? you know, wanting to mo colonize Mars, and how much of it is Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Amazon, and Amazon, as uh, by extension, has a lot of great innovations, don't get me wrong, but just the idea of e-commerce, what does that really do for us? You know, for somebody that actually uses their time properly, Amazon's great. You can save so much time shopping, you get all these books online, it's great if you're somebody that's going to use your freedom properly like someone with the warrior spirit, but for, for the average person, they're using Amazon as a crutch to not go outside. They're using it as a crutch to stay inside and be lazy. So how, how much of human innovation these days is for actually pushing humanity forward and how much of it is for consumption? How much of it is purely to make money? And most inventions today aren't something that makes humanity richer, that brings us to a level of higher existence. It's simply something that makes life easier, something that people are going to buy to make their life easier. And this is what happens when your country is now ruled by a bourgeois economic mercantile elite and not the warrior elite. You are not incentivized by nature. You're not made to be savagely excellent because of nature to survive. You work to make more money. You work to be more comfortable, right? And this is the issue with, with sort of mass rule compared to the, the rule of the few with the aristocratic warrior elite. The masses don't care about pursuing greater things. They don't care about mastering arts. Some of them do, but they're no longer the masses when they care. Then, then there's somebody that is imbued with the aristocratic spirit. But most people, they want to watch their football game. I watch football too. 
I'm not going to blame them, but they want to watch their football. They want to go drink on the weekend. They want to watch their Netflix. They want to jerk off to porn, whatever. And we all have vices, you know? We get caught up in these things too, but is that all we're going to do? Is that everything? You're just going to watch porn all day for the rest of your life? Is that the aristocratic spirit? No, right? So the, the big thing is when you have a rule by a warrior elite, that's the ideal. You, you idealize the hero who is a great warrior, who is beautiful physically, and who is beautiful mentally too, because the warrior oftentimes can't just be a brute, you know, a strong brute. He has to be intelligent as well, because if you look at the appeal of the great warriors of history, you know, the Iliad, obviously, a lot of it's myth, but if you look at how Achilles is portrayed, he's not portrayed as a mindless brute. He's actually portrayed as quite introspective. Um, after he kills Hector, you sort of see his thought process, or at least his conversation with Hector's father, and his guilt that he feels, and the sort of conflicting feeling he has towards, towards the death of Hector, because he wanted to get revenge for the death of his cousin and uh, friend Patroclus, but he also thinks of his own father, and he thinks about how Priam, Hector's father, is feeling. His son is dead, and he thinks about his own father. Achilles thinks, what would his father think if he had died? And he has compassion for Priam. This is beautiful. It shows the three-dimensional nature of the hero. Or you look at Miyamoto Musashi, who, who, who is the most well-known Japanese swordsman in history, and you read his, the Book of Five Rings, or you look at the Dakado. It's, it's so introspective, and it's so beautiful, and it's, it's art. He, these are intelligent people who we idealize, right? So that that's sort of what is lost today, you know, and I think that when you don't have the ideals at the top of the society who who exude heroism, who are aesthetically beautiful, who are introspective and intelligent, if you don't have those people at the top of society anymore, who does the lower who do the lower classes have to look to as role models? If you look at most people that are in charge today, they're old, they're out of shape, they're ugly, they lack the youthful vigor of the old heroes in Rome and Greece, and they're just nothing to want to aspire to. Like, Elon Musk is a role model for most people, and don't get me wrong, he's not a bad role model per se, but you compare him to, to like Julius Caesar or Alexander, you compare him to these, these great heroes, essentially, or, or to the mythical legends such as Achilles. You compare him to that, and while he is great by today's standards, what is he compared to the heroes of old? Right? Men who literally soak the field in the blood of their enemies. And maybe I'm romanticizing the past a bit, but that's, I think, what we all do when the future seems so dull and dreary and we're stuck in the Kali Yuga, where we're stuck in a nihilistic age of mindless consumerism and materialism. But, yeah, I, I am idealizing the past a bit. Don't get me wrong. But it's something to think about. And I'll do more videos on, on the warrior tradition and and uh, the warrior elites, and, and, you know, this is a video I'm going to kind of, like, this is a topic I'm going to bring up a lot, but if there's something to take from this video, it's, it's the sort of what you get from having a warrior elite, the benefits, and the benefits of warrior spirit, of seeking aesthetic beauty, aesthetic power, and also introspectiveness, being able to think, why am I fighting? Why do I wage war? Because the difference between the soldier and the warrior is the soldier fights on the battlefield, excuse me, voice crack, because he wants benefits maybe, because uh, he doesn't know what else to do, because he's been manipulated by the economic elite to think that he's fighting for freedom somewhere, or he's fighting for the defense of his country. But the warrior doesn't think this way. The warrior is generally more authentic in the reason for warfare. They fight because they want to prove themselves more powerful than their enemies. Nietzsche talks about this. Nietzsche says most people, like the higher beings, they don't they don't exude their power to prove to other people they're strong. They do it to prove themselves, prove to themselves that they are strong. Nietzsche and Bronze Age Pervert talk about a philosophy of, of the body, of, of actual physical beauty. Nietzsche talks about this, of physical beauty. If you don't have a physically beautiful body, you were lacking a certain element in connection of nature because nature must be, nature demands health. You must be healthy to survive in nature. You must be strong. And when an intellectual is not strong, he does not live in accordance with nature, so he's detached from reality in a certain extent. And this isn't, I think, Nietzsche's critique of, of rationalist, right? Being detached from, from real life to deny life affirmation. And 
if, and, and Yuki Mishima, Mishima talks about this too. The intellectual with a pudgy belly, a protruding belly, or a skinny, frail body will criticize the hero, right? He'll criticize the hero because he himself is not strong like the hero is. But the hero lives in accordance with nature. Nature demands you to be physically strong. But the intellectual who is not physically strong is not living in accordance with nature. They are living in a false world. They are living in a fake world, a construction of their mind. The same way that Mishima lived his life early on when he talks about the corrosive nature of words. When he was skinny and frail, he escaped to the dream world in his writing through his art, which would be eternal, while the body eventually fades or it dies at the height of its beauty. Body is temporary, but there's a temporariness to action. You just throw one punch. That one punch might be exhilarating. You knock somebody out, but it's only that split second that you knock them out. You're never going to knock them out that same way again. You just knock them out once. There's a beauty in the, the briefness of action versus a painting, which is also beautiful. But you need both. You need the lasting existence of the beautiful painting, and you need the beauty of the brief, quick explosion and power of action. And you can't just have the intellect. You can't just have the lasting art. You have to have the art of the body, the, the philosophy of action, so to speak. And um, what else? Just to close off, you know, I've been, I think I said this in a recent video, but I just want to say it again because it's a, I recently went, read Twilight of the Idols. And there's a lot of parallels between Twilight of the Idols and Bronze Age Mindset. And one of them is the idea of noble peoples dying freely. The true warrior does not accept defeat. He either triumphs in battle, is victorious, or he dies free. He will never accept servitude. The samurai who dies in battle does not surrender to another um, lord. He does, not, he does not surrender to another daimyo. He commits seppuku and dies with honor. He is killed. Uh, he kills himself before being shamed and captured by the enemy. He fights to the death. You either exist powerfully, you exist as a great being, or you die. It's like, the 49ers lost the Super Bowl recently, which I was really depressed about because I love Brock Purdy. Um, but I was thinking about it, and, you know, the warrior doesn't have this same phenomena. The true warrior will never experience the loss that the 49ers did because if he loses, he's dead, right? You either are great or you die. And there's a certain simplicity and beauty to that. Like, you either are the best or you die. You don't have to worry about being a loser. You die free. You die noble. You die greatly. And Nietzsche talks about being a noble people is choosing the time of your death. And, you know, Mishima talks about dying at the height of your beauty, dying while you're still strong and virile before you can decay into old age and wither away. And not saying I'm going to die at like 35 or whatever, but there's something, you know, there, this idea of dying at the height of one's beauty. He talks about, or I think, I don't, I don't know if it's actually in one of his books or if it's just in the movie Mishima, Life of Four Chapters. It might have been in Sun and Steel. I can't remember. But he says something along the lines of the average age during the Bronze Age was, or the average, like, I forget if it was the average age or the average age to die. I think it was the average age to die in the Bronze Age was 18, 21 in the Roman era. How beautiful heaven must have been, right? This idea that heaven is filled with these beautiful young heroes who died young but died beautifully versus today how ugly heaven is, filled with all these decrepit old people. You know, no offense to my grandparents, right? But anyway, just something to think about. And uh, I'll probably revisit the warrior tradition in the past. We'll just mix up the title a little bit. We'll say like the warrior culture or something like that. But um, yeah, I'm healing up nicely. Um, kind of, my neck kind of hurts because I'm trying to exercise, not wearing it too much. I'm about to put it back on, go for a walk, maybe smoke a cigar. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. If you watched this far, um, I'm going to get back to doing 10-minute uh, philosophy videos, which are actually closer to an hour. Um, I'm going to be doing a video um, on Dune and specifically eugenics in Dune, talking about the creation of the Sardaukar and the the uh, this, the Fremen under Paul Atreides. And I'll be talking about the Bene Gesserit breeding program as well. And that video will be coming up and released right before the mo new movie comes out. And I'm going to release it on Leap Year because we don't get Leap Years that often. So that'll be kind of cool. But anyway, yeah, life life is good. I'm working I'm working out again, and uh, yeah, this was the warrior tradition. I bought a cheap thirty dollar sword from Amazon. I'm gonna make so if you've seen aesthetic accelerationism, one of my last videos, I kind of was trying that uh, book club schizo format, and uh, I'm gonna be doing a schizo sun and steel video at some point. Um, now I also got a knife for when I go out to the woods to go fight bears. I'm also going to get a spear at some point. But this is actually only 20 bucks and it's a pretty pretty good knife. Nice weight to it, right? Um, but yeah, life is good. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Let me just get one more good pose for the thumbnail.
what is that? Is that good for a thumbnail? Just like the freaking wait. The sword. The sword's supposed to be modeled after the last samurai. So here. We'll do like one little freaking There we go. <laughs> hey, that kind of sounded like swords hitting each other. Yeah. So uh thanks for putting up with me. Love you all. Mwah. Stay strong, stay beautiful, stay uh, warrior philosophizing. As always, this is the Warrior Philosopher, building the foundations of the warrior philosophy. And we will see you next time.